My name it's all right, settle down. Settle down. My name is Greg Peterson, and I am the president of the Robert H. Jackson Center. And you're in the Robert H. Jackson Center. And we're honored and thrilled that you're here for a very, very special afternoon with Jane Yolen. I know you've had a chance to read her book, Devil's Arithmetic, and it's that book was the basis upon which we had an essay contest. An essay contest which uh, we were able to, throughout New York State, and many of the folks here had a chance to participate in, and we had some essay contest runner-ups, and we had some essay contest winners. And I'd like to recognize and acknowledge them. Last night, we were able to give out awards to these individuals, and they received certificates and an autograph book by the author, Jane Yolen. And in addition to the statewide essay contest winners, they received, a, in addition to those things, a $500 uh, savings bond. First of all, let me acknowledge those who were the essay contest runner-ups. From Forestville, Cassandra Pickering. From Forestville, Allison Kaminsky. From Forestville, Gabrielle Gattawaltz. From Ripley, Riley Hawkins. And also from Ripley, Annalise Mellers. Can we just give them a nice hand? Then we had some statewide essay contest winners. From the Wilson Foundation, Paige Jackson. From the St. Edward the Confessor in Bayville, New York, Blair Brunetti. From the Milton L. Olive Middle School in Wyandanche, New York, Christian Gregory. And from right here, right here in Chautauqua County, Kirsten Elliott from Chautauqua Lake Central School. And if you would please rise, let's give her a big hand. <laughs> Congratulations. I think you had some fans here. This does not happen without the assistance of an awful lot of corporate sponsors, and you've seen many of them here. I will not recite that which has been presented, but I just want to publicly thank the sponsors who've underwritten this event, and uh, among those, the New York State Law, Youth, and Citizenship Program, which is part of the New York State Bar Foundation, who not only created the essay, but also provided us much of the, and the grading of the essays, but also provided us with some financial support as well. And so I want to give them a big round of applause as well. <laughs> what we'll be doing is we're going to watch a short film clip, which is basic introduction to the movie Devil's Arithmetic, which was successfully shown on Showtime. And then after that, the co-coordinator of the event, Paul Lombardo, will introduce our speaker, Jane Yolen. The screen will rise, and magically, Jane Yolen will appear. And this overflow crowd, and we can't thank all the teachers for making this all possible here. So, Ed, without any further ado, we'll watch the movie. One of the most rewarding things about being a parent is its cycle of education. You teach your children, and just as often, they teach you. Hello, I'm Dustin Hoffman, and along with Mimi Rogers, as producers and parents, we are proud to be involved in this special Showtime presentation of The Devil's Arithmetic. It's a provocative film about how a teenage girl relives her family's Holocaust experience in a dramatically vivid and sometimes frightening way. When I first brought the script home, I learned from my 10-year-old daughter that it was based on a popular children's book. 
that she had been reading at school. This story has touched the lives of young readers by making history come alive, combining harsh realities with the magical elements of fable. And as in the book, there are scenes in this film that are disturbing, but they don't begin to show the full extent of the horror that took place during the Holocaust. Violence is often used as a way to entertain our children as fantasy without consequence. But the brutality and the inhumanity of the Holocaust were real, not fantasy, and they affect us today and they will affect us tomorrow as well. Indifference to hatred and prejudice take root and grow in impressionable minds and only the light of history can turn the horror of this 20th century into a profound lesson for our children. We must teach them to remember. I now invite you to share with me a young woman's extraordinary journey of discovery where friendship, love, and courage are the rewards of caring for others, where each day the faces of evil determine who will live and who will die. The Devil's Arithmetic. Do I have to go? We're not going through this again. Get dressed. It's a waste of time. Some things you have to do because you have to do them. We're going because it's important. Why is it important? It's important because I say it's important. That's shrewd, Mom. That's really shrewd. <laughs> Every time I see you, you look more like her. And every time I see you, you say the same thing. Well, the shape of your mouth, the color of your eyes, you're blessed with her beauty. And her name. If her name lives on in you, nothing can give me greater pleasure. Why don't you tell me more about her? You wouldn't understand. Understand what? What it was like in the camps. What we lived through, if we lived. What it was to be a Jew. This experience is so far from your world, I am afraid. Though I so want to tell you what happened, it will mean nothing to you. And that would hurt me very much. You see? Mm -hmm. Good. Now come. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Lombardo, and I'm a volunteer at the Robert H. Jackson Center and a member of the Education Committee here. Today, on behalf of the Robert H. Jackson Center, its founder, Mr. Greg Peterson, the staff and volunteers here at the Jackson Center, the Chautauqua County Arts Council, the Regilene A. Civic Center, Eileen Garish, and the New York State Bar Association Law, Youth, and Citizenship Group, Mr. Ed Tomasini, Mike Beba, Chris Mason, and all the technicians involved with this program, our sponsors of the event, and Mrs. Anita Sanctuary, the coordinator of the author series program here at the center. I wish to welcome all students, educators, and our award winner who have joined us here to listen to words from Ms. Jane Yolen on her award-winning novel, The Devil's Arithmetic. This particular novel of Ms. Yolen's, one of 300 books which she has penned, has received critical acclaim, having won the National Jewish Book Award in the category of children's literature <clears throat> in 1989. Having been selected as a finalist for the Nebula Award for Best Novel in 1988, and having won both the Jewish Book Council Award and the Association of Jewish Libraries Sidney Taylor Award. Throughout history, there have been many versions of the statement, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The roots of that statement travel back through the ages, with some even giving the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle credit for those words. In times where there are some who are trying to deny that the Holocaust actually happened, we are in dire need of authors and their literature who will never allow us to give credence to that notion. Jane Yolen is one of those authors, and The Devil's Arithmetic is one of those needed pieces of literature. Her novel reminds us of the cruel and inhuman atrocities that occurred in the 1940s and her literary talents exhibited in The Devil's Arithmetic 
allow us to remember the past, lest we be condemned to repeat it. We are thrilled, excited, and grateful that she has taken time out of her life to join us here today and share some of her thoughts. At this time, it is both an honor and a privilege for me to introduce to all of you Ms. Jane Yolen. All right. Ah, there we go. They have me standing on a box because I'm short. Um, and I can only see the first three or four rows, but I know there are more of you out there. I'm going to take some time uh, to first thank you all for coming. Uh, thank Kristen, who seems to have got the wave down. Um, and I want to talk to you today about the writing of the devil's arithmetic. But I also want to talk to you in terms of being a hero. It's a, a woman named Ruth Franklin who wrote a book called A Thousand Darknesses. And in that book, she said that to write about atrocity is impossible, um, yet not to write about it. Though to do so is absurd, obscene, repugnant, insect-like, is equally impossible. So I want us to think about that as I talk today. Think about why anything should be impossible for a poet or a writer to write about. Think about what the obligations of a writer to the book and the characters in it are to the audience reading the book, to the history that began the idea of the book, to the justice that may or may not have been part of the history behind the book, and perhaps even most important to the writer's own vision of the book and her response to the world. And in order to do that, because I have written not one, but two novels about the, um, the Holocaust. I've written short stories about the Holocaust, and I've written a number of poems about the Holocaust. I thought that I would also read some of the poems, because I think there are many ways to witness, witness being a word that we can use in many different ways. Um, to witness something could be to have been there at the time, to have gone through uh, what the people who had been there went through. But to witness something can also mean to speak of it in some way, to acknowledge it, uh, to read about it, to learn about it. That we can all be witnesses in that case. Uh, last night, uh, here in this very center, we saw and, uh, and listened to a woman who had been, as a child, um, just about your age, she was 13, I think, when she was first taken and put into um, first two labor camps and then two concentration camps. Her parents, her four siblings were murdered, and she was left alone uh, in the situation at the end, almost on the day that the, that the uh, war ended, she and 1,500 girls your age were forced marched from Poland to Czechoslovakia. And when they got there, only 150 were still alive. We can't witness the way she did but we can witness in our own way. So here's the first poem that I want to read to you. It was in a, an anthology of war poems, and I was asked to write the poem about the Holocaust. It's called Alphabet. What is the alphabet of evil? Auschwitz, Buchenwald, Helmno, the names of camps rolling off the tongue, the tongue lolling in the mouth, the mouth hanging open, broken teeth, a gasp of breath the alphabet of death. What is the alphabet of evil? Dachau, Esterwagen, Flossenburg, Gurs, the names of camps cramping the stomach, the stomach drained of blood, blood staining the ground, a last breath, the alphabet of death. What is the alphabet of evil? It begins with Adolf Hitler, goes to Sonderkommandos, ends with the ordinary citizen turning in his neighbor, a shekel for a traitor, a groat for a Jew. What is the alphabet of evil? 
small letters we all know how to say and hope we are never asked in our ordinary lives to say them. Well, there is no getting around it. Writing about the Holocaust in fiction, in poetry, in any kind of prose is a dialogue between those of us who are not and maybe never were in the middle of a life of such agony and terror and history itself, and those who we hope will never have to go through it, except in the pages of the book. So I ask the question again, though slightly differently this time. Think about what are the obligations of a writer to the book and the characters in it, to the audience reading the book, to the history that began the idea of the book, and perhaps most important, to the writer's own vision of the book and the world. Now that question is a tough one for me because I never wanted to write The Devil's Arithmetic. Uh, I never wanted to write it in the first place and I started it without a plan. I know the teachers are going to shudder at the thought of this, but I did. I started it without a plan. Though I have to be honest, many of my books and stories begin that way. No plan, just a rush of idea or a character tapping me on the shoulder or a line of poetry in my ear. Some books are fun to write. Some are written to pay the bills. And some books have to be written. Um, why? Because even though they're painful experiences, they may have a chance to make a difference to the world. Now these kinds of books may be painful or difficult for any number of reasons. Um, maybe because they are deep books that touch on an author's personal secrets, or because the writer keeps getting things wrong, um, or losing the plot, or a character runs away with the story who never was supposed to have been in the story to begin with. Or they may be painful because the subject matter is devastating. And of course, writing The Devil's Arithmetic was that kind of book. Now I want to start at the beginning to tell you how it happened. I was having lunch with my editor at Viking. We had just finished one book and she wanted to know what was the next thing I was thinking about. She also wanted to know why even though I'm Jewish, I had never written a Jewish book. Uh, she was a rabbi's wife, so she can be um, excused for asking that question. It was logical to her to ask that question, but the answer was simple. I was growing, when I grew up, I was more interested in the Greek gods, the Arthurian myth, the Celtic stories, the stories about fairies, much more interested in them than in Jehovah and the Bible. My family was very secular, which means we didn't do much that was Jewish. Uh, we didn't go to temple, we didn't keep kosher, we didn't speak Yiddish, we didn't celebrate Hanukkah. We only went to seders, um, for Passover, if somebody else put them on. We didn't know how to put them on. And the Viking editor and I um, discussed this, and I had, yes, lots and lots of ideas, most of which were fantasies. Um, she didn't like fantasy novels. She wanted something else. She wanted something real. She wanted something Jewish. So offhandedly, as I much too often do, I said, well, if I write a novel that's Jewish at the core, it would have to be about a modern girl who goes back in time to the time of the Holocaust, because I was sneaking a fantasy element into it. Sorry, I have sinusitis, please excuse me. And she answered, I want that book. And I said, yeah, right. You know, that wasn't nice, it wasn't polite, but that's how I felt. Lunch was over, we went our separate ways, but she would not let it go. Uh, she knew sooner than I did that this was a book I had to write. So she called or wrote to me about once a month. Now this was before email, before the internet, before Facebook, before text messaging. If all of those things had been available, she would probably be contacting me every single day. Um, and she asked if I had given the book much thought. Have you done it? Have you thought about it? Do you want to talk some more about it? It was endless. Um, she became 
in Yiddish, the Yiddish word is anudge. She was after me all the time. Finally, to shut her up, I wrote the first chapter. Um, it was just very similar to the first chapter that's in the book now. And I said, here, here it is. It doesn't work. It can't work. It can't be done. And she sent me, in return, a contract and a check, something all writers are interested in. Well, not the contract, but the check. Um, and a deadline for a year from then, um, something no writer, except for me, is eager for. And I was stuck. Because I realized something she had known all along, which is that it was a book that I had to write. But, big but, but I didn't know enough. I didn't know much about being Jewish beyond the bar mitzvahs of family members that I had gone to. I had been in confirmation class uh, and Sunday school for one year, one year, uh, in which year I learned how to read Hebrew and I was the first girl to read from the Torah in, uh, in the congregation. I'd gone to some seders at my, with my parents and brother at Uncle Lou's and Aunt Gert's house. I remember how Uncle Lou used to say, while reading the story of the Exodus out of Egypt, um, he would say, and how do I know all this? I was there, which I lifted and used directly in the book. So I had to read and read and read some more. I read about Jewish customs and about Jewish shtetls, the little villages in the old country, about Jewish weddings with klezmer bands. I read a lot about klezmer as well. I spoke to my uncles and aunts and cousins about what they remembered or passed down about where and how my father's family had lived in the Ukraine, which eventually all that information got used in three other books, um, 12 Chinese Acrobats, Milk and Honey, and Naming Liberty. I patterned Hannah after me at that age, a girl who was a little bit whiny, tired of being told what to do, um, tired of being told she should remember. I was more comfortable with younger children than older ones. I was a good storyteller. I adored my younger brother. I was a bit of a tomboy. I spoke out against injustice. And over the years, I stood on many vigil lines, which in the 1960s and 70s mainly consisted of Jews, Quakers, and the occasional Unitarian. That was me. That was Hannah, too. So I had my main character without much of a stretch. And then I began to read about the Holocaust. And that was where things got really, really tough. Spending six to eight months reading about the awful things that the Nazis did to the Jews, as well as to the gypsies, the homosexuals, the communists, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the handicapped people, and the twins, uh, and anyone who had disagreed with them, was difficult. It made me go from despair to hatred back to despair again. I read histories, biographies, autobiographies, letters. I looked at maps. I found the blueprints of uh, concentration camps. I interviewed Holocaust survivors. I watched nonfiction movies like Shoah, and I had nightmares at night. My children said I wasn't much fun to be around during that period either. And then I started to write, and I am often asked a variation of the question, did you plot the book scene by scene, or did you start with an idea and let it flow? The people who ask me about plotting scene by scene are usually teachers. The people who actually ask me about letting the idea flow tend to be other writers. Um, they wanted to know, did I know how Hannah was going to get back home at the time that she departed? Uh, did you know the relationship between Aunt Eva and Rivka before Hannah left? Now, I have to admit to you that there are writers who know every inch of a book before starting. They have plotted carefully. They understand relationships, they outline extensively, and they know the ending before ever putting a word down. I do not. I am not that kind of writer. I like to be surprised. Uh, and even if I have an idea about what's going to happen, and I have some ideas about what's going to happen, certainly I think about the ending. But by the time I reach the ending, in my writing, everything has been changed by the journey getting there. 
and it was that way with Devil's Arithmetic. Now, this is what I knew going into the book. I knew Hannah was going to open the door at the Seder and find herself back in Poland or the Ukraine. She tries to tell her companions who and what the Nazis were, and no one believes her, but she keeps trying until they all understand. She is taken to a concentration camp, maybe Auschwitz, along with the entire village. And with the help of an ancient rabbi, she becomes a hero, plotting an escape for herself and her friends, and they all get free. Now, if you have read the book, you will already know that most of that, that I thought I knew at the start of the book, simply doesn't happen. That's from my notes that I found. And I have to laugh because of how far away from those notes I swayed, strayed. Because as I wrote, I kept my research close to hand. And Hannah's journey, I realized, had to be more difficult than my original plan. She had to love someone. Um, it could be an aunt, an uncle, several friends, all of whom suddenly appeared in the book. She had to love someone so that the troubles in the camp had to meet, could mean something. She couldn't spend time with the old rabbi because men and women were usually separated. And besides, a rabbi of that time would have had more to say to the boys who studied with him than, the girl, and than to a young girl who, by tradition in those days, never got to study at all. And this being the Holocaust, people were going to die. Lots of people. Hannah was going to a concentration camp, not a summer camp. So people were going to die. Few escaped from those camps alive. And I didn't set the story in Auschwitz, a real camp, though I borrowed the sign over the over the, the gate that says, Arbeit macht frei, um, labor lets you, sets you free. It was a sign that also appeared over the gates of several other concentration camps, Dachau, Grossrosen, Sachsenhausen, and Therianestadt. And that was a conscious decision. I didn't want anybody to say, we know everything about what happened in Auschwitz, and this never did. Because if the Germans were one thing, they were careful note keepers. So we do know what happened on certain days in Auschwitz. Also, a dear friend of mine had 25 years before I started writing the book, told me a story about how he was in a Polish work camp as a young child and how the, every time the commandant would come to look over the camp, the children had to jump into the midden pile the garbage heap, because the commandant had said, if I don't see them, they live. If I do see them, they die. And so the only place that he didn't inspect was the midden pile. So my friend told me that all of their shoes had been taken when they got to the camp, and they had been given different clothes to wear. The parents who were still alive, or the other adults who were there, had carved them all little wooden shoes. And he said, you could hear them running when the, the signal was given, it was a whistle, a signal was given that the commandant was, was coming in his car to visit the camp. And you'd hear all those little wooden shoes running all from all areas of the camp. The children would take off their little wooden shoes because they were too important to lose them. And then they would dive into the midden pile and wait there until the commandant had gone. Well, you can't hear a story like that if you are a novelist and not keep it somewhere in the back of your brain. And so that had stuck in my mind all those years. And I knew when I started The Devil's Arithmetic that I had to find some place to use it. So the camp in Devil's Arithmetic is an amalgam of a lot of different things that I read that I heard, that I saw, the stories that I had been told, all of those built up inside and started me on that journey. Now, how much of this was conscious? There's something, I'll, that's something I'll never be able to uh, completely sort out because I find my story as I write, especially a story 
like this, compounded of interviews and other people's harsh biographies and research and hidden memories. And I wrote from scene to scene to scene, discovering the story as I went. I was surprised in the end when Hannah had grown up enough so that she was willing to lay down her life for a friend, hoping that she herself still lived in the future. And I was even more surprised by the Aunt Eva Rivka, Rivka connection. It was not in my mind when I started writing the book, not even in my mind when I started writing the final scene. Once I found that out though, once it seemed right, I had to go back and add little pieces so that it would, you would think that I had been thinking about it from the very beginning. Now I've known uh, from doing a lot of books um, that things will work out if I trust my characters and follow where they lead. Sometimes I feel like they're running ahead and I'm running after them shouting, wait for me, wait for me. Um, sometimes they surprise me. Sometimes they appall me. Sometimes they make me proud, just like people. I also know, though, that magic can happen when you're writing. For example, I, there was a place in the book when they are in the concentration camp, and I needed, I felt some sort of Jewish folk tale for one character to tell the others at that point. I didn't know what I wanted. I just knew I wanted something. Um, I wanted it to point emotionally to where Hannah was emotionally and to lead the reader on and to make the reader think. So I have a huge folklore library. I write a lot of folk tales. I edit a lot of folk tales. I um, redact a lot of folk tales. That means you tell the stories from a different point of view. Um, and I have this huge personal folk tale library. So I simply cleared the shelf of all the Jewish stories, the Jewish folk tales, and I put them by the side of my desk and I settled down to simply write, uh, to simply read until I found the right story. And without thinking, I picked a book from the pile, opened it up sort of in the middle, and started reading a story about a werewolf. I didn't know there were Jewish stories about werewolves, but there it was. And I thought, this is the story. This is the story I want. And wasn't that magical? It was the first book that I picked up without thinking, opened it to the middle, without looking up anything, and there was the story that I needed and I used in the book. Another magic moment happened when I discovered the character of the fool because I discovered such a thing in my research. And he became the character who was able to speak prophetically to the others, and those prophecies become moments of foreshadowing in the book. And the way Hannah finds herself back in the future was totally unplanned. All I knew was she was going to return, but I didn't know how. And I couldn't know until I made the connection between two doors. The door that's open for Elijah at the Seder at the beginning, and the door that opens into the crematorium at the end. And it was as I had her open the door to the crematorium at the end, she said the same lines that she said at the beginning of the book because I suddenly knew how she was going back. Writing for me is always an adventure. I love it because it is an adventure. I, used to, with my children, well, sometimes we still do, uh, when my husband was alive we would, and the children were little, we would go on serendipity trips, we would call them. Serendipity means a happy accident. And when somebody decided that a road looked interesting or a sign talking about something off that road looks in interesting, they would say, that one, I want to go on that one. And off we would go um, serendipitously to find something new and exciting and different. We found, for example, the last manned um, lighthouse in Scotland on the last day before it was all going to be automated. We found a dinosaur uh, footprints along the Connecticut River uh, in the stone. 
we found all kinds of things where one child or my husband or I said, let's go that way. And that's how I write. Um, for me, too much planning ahead dampens my enthusiasm and deadens the book for me. But other writers I know, including my son Adam, including my friend Bruce Coville, both of whom I have written books with, they need to plan in infinite detail ahead of time and are very happy that way. But as I tell teachers very often, when they have students sit in the classroom and you're supposed to, in 30 minutes, write a short story or a, or a, um, a poem, you're supposed to outline it ahead of time. I said, some people outline. Some people do not. Some people need structure. Some people do not. There is no wrong way to write, and many right ways. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about time, fa time travel fantasy, because Devil's Arithmetic is a time travel fantasy. There's always a huge amount of argument in science fiction and fantasy circles, whether it's science fiction and, and fantasy is the subtext, the, the sub-genre, or, <coughs> or if fantasy is the, is the top genre and science fiction is, the, um, uh, is under that. It's an old fight. Um, but there is one kind in which the two are so intermingled it's hard to know which is which, and that's time travel, or the time travel story. Essentially, there are two kinds of time travel, of course. One is you go forward in time, and one is you go back in time. Uh, sometimes it's the viewpoint character who does the traveling, back to King Arthur's court, back to the Children's Crusade, forward to converse uh, with... Uh, their great-great-great-grandchildren or the Eloy. Occasionally, it's another character who comes to the fore. Um, but the implements of time travel are what interest me, those things which allow the traveler to slip through, thank you, uh, to slip through uh, the streams of time, like a minnow in a brook. We have all kinds of things. Um, there, are, uh, there are tuning forks. There are... Um, elaborate devices like time machines, there are silver pins, magic mirrors, wardrobe cupboards, um, uh, conjunctions of moons, planets, stars. And in The Devil's Arithmetic, of course, there is a modern girl opening the door in, during the Seder to Elijah, who has a place setting at the Seder table. Now, I remember once at one of the family seders, we opened the door and one of my uncles walked in just at that moment. I had a friend who had a seder and he opened the, she opened the door, the youngest child opens the door and a cat walked in. Now, this was not Elijah or maybe it was, we don't know. Um, but I have my girl who is steadfastly saying she's not gonna remember anything um, opening the door for Elijah and finding herself back in time. And when she opens the door, she says, ready or not, here I come. And that's kind of a magical incantation that we use as children. Ready or not, here I come. So when I had her open the door at the crematorium, that line came out too. That's the line that was there. None of us is really ready for a trip to the past or into the future. We all fight time. You children, you're eager at once, you want to grow up, but you sort of want to remain young as well. Peter Pan, you know, is a very, very perceptive book. I've just turned 72. Um, I find myself finding t fighting time in another way. Good hairdressers, diets, long walks, um, I'm on that other side of the scale of life. There's a poem that I really like. I'll just read you part of it. It's Walter de la Mar's poem called Poor Jim Jay. And Jim Jay got stuck fast in yesterday. Round veered the weathercock. The sun drew in and stuck was Jim like a rusty pin. But all in vain the clock struck one and there was Jim 
a little bit gone. I think any of us reading a historical novel, for example, um, is a little bit gone. We have one foot in today, one foot back in 1942 or 1857 or 1066 or whenever the, the uh, book is set. Uh, but it makes history very immediate to us and accessible, uh, letting us see backwards through a clear lens. So making history come alive is not only very um, uh, good in a historical novel, but in a time travel novel too. Um, why not just a well-written textbook? I don't know about you, but textbook, history textbooks make me fall asleep. Um, there's just so much I can read about the gross national product of anything. Um, or why um, this king or that king closed the monasteries or opened trade to the east. But if I'm reading a novel about a king who has made that decision for different reasons and is arguing with his ministers, it comes alive to me. Uh, you know, we adults, but children even more, um, don't have a hard time believing some things about history. You kids, for example, um, can you believe that parents would allow their children to go on a hazardous journey across the Alps with only the company of other children and a couple of priests? Um, not when you have permission, you have trouble getting permission to stay out an extra half hour on Saturday night. Um, not when you have um, a mother I was that kind of mother, who packed special uh, bag f for any of my kids' overnight camping trips. Not that you have a father who, like my husband, would do surreptitious drive-bys around 10 o'clock at night to make sure the kids were okay at the campsite. So how can you believe in the children's crusade? You know what you know. I know as an adult, I still have trouble, though I've read all the documents, believing that real people killed men, women, and children, the children of the hardest, uh, in a programmed mechanical way, stripping their teeth for the gold, using their hair to stuff mattresses, boiling down the body fat for soap, using their skin for lampshades, just because they were ordered to, or just because they found it interesting, or just because just because. I mean, this is not Friday the 13th, part 27, with ketchup for blood, and yet I spoke to a group of students uh, about the time I was writing The Devil's Arithmetic. Now, this was 25 years ago, and the students were in Indianapolis, and they said to me, are you making this up? And I said, no, I'm not making this up. This happened. Do you not know anything about the Holocaust? These were eighth graders. They didn't. And I said, well, how long have you been in this school? And most of them had been in the school for eight years. I said, well, I've been in your school for one day. And I know that two of your teachers are Holocaust survivors. They went, no, really? I said, yeah. Well, how do you know? I said. Well, that's your assignment. You now have to find out who they are. And the next year, for the first time ever, that school was teaching the Holocaust to the seventh and eighth graders. How did I know? I was having lunch with some of the teachers. One of them had a number on her arm. She told me about another, um, a younger man, whose parents had taken him babe in arms on the last train out of wherever it was before the Nazis had come and that they had to race across Europe till they finally got to, I think it was Portugal, and took the boat out. I knew because I recognized something and these students did not because they'd never heard of it. I think that if you take a book 
that starts in the real world and you thrust a young reader back into the heart and mind of someone his or her own age, 40 or 60 or 100 or 1,000 years ago, and you let that protagonist ask questions that you kids want to know now. Um, for example, how can you believe these Nazis when they say you're only going to be resettled? How do you know? Why haven't you fought? Why don't you get guns? Why hadn't you stockpiled guns when you heard things were going badly? The answers they get from the folks in the story will astound them, will shake them into new awarenesses, will let the readers remember and be part of history. Not just kids, I remembered for the test, but I remember because I was there. I want you, when you read, to become part of a living and continuous process, forced to acknowledge that we are our past, just as we will become our future. I believe this so strongly that when I was at last ready to confront what for any Jewish author has to be the most difficult and unrelieved period in history, I knew that the only way I could write it was as a tri time travel novel. Um, but I don't think I thought this out in logical steps. It just came to me. I just knew that this was what I wanted to do. I didn't want um, my readers to say, do you make this stuff up? I wanted to throw you guys, body and soul, into the cauldron so that you understand that it had been all but impossible to fight to stay alive. That within that hideous arena, though, there existed not just hate, but love, not only carelessness, but caring. Not only hopelessness, but hope and an abiding truth within the careful catalog of lies. Last night's speaker, the Holocaust survivor, said to us all at the end of her talk, a woman who had been through the most hideous, horrible, unforgettable, degrading, um, nightmarish existence, as a, as a teenager, um, said to us, love one another, be kind to one another, help one another, seek justice for the underdog. I mean, she was amazing. And that's what I wanted you guys to remember and to witness. I wanted also um, to tell you about the scene in the Devil's Arithmetic that is my favorite scene. Now, understand, I don't reread my own books once they're published. I reread them 7, 10, 15, 20 times when I'm writing them and revising them. But once they're out there, there's no reason for me to read them. They're for you. They're no longer for me. Uh, I get kids all the time writing to me, especially on email, saying, I have a paper due tomorrow on Devil's Arithmetic, and will you please explain the line on page 24 that says, or page 96, or, that says such and such. And I know that that's a question from the take-home test. And I say, you've read the book this past week, or these past weeks. I haven't read the book in 25 years. I have not a clue. Besides, my job is to write the book. I don't do homework. Your job is to do homework. And except for one kid who called me a farted up old lady when I gave him that answer, everybody has understood. They've said, you know, okay, I get it. Um, thanks, but thanks for writing to me. Can you tell me one thing about the book that, that I might not know? And then I usually send them one thing about the book they might not know. Now you've heard all the things that I send kids, so I don't bother writing to me. <laughs> I have nothing more to say. But this is my favorite scene. Uh, it's when Hannah and Rivka are talking in the camp, and Hannah says, uh, we should fight. We should go down fighting. Because she is, after all, a child of today. Uh, she's probably seen a lot of Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. 
because uh, they're all on television over and over and over again. And Rivka laughs. What would we fight with? With guns. We have no guns. With knives. Where are our knives? With something. Rivka put her arm around Hannah's, sh Hannah's shoulder. Come, there is more work to be done. Work is not fighting. You want to be a hero, like Joshua at Jericho, like Samson against the Philistines, she smiled. I, I want to be a hero like, Hannah thought for a minute, came up with nothing. Who? I don't know. My mother said before she died that it is much harder to live this way and to die this way than to go out shooting, much harder. Chaya, you are a hero. I am a hero. Rifka stared for a moment at the sky and the curling smoke. We are all heroes here. History is full of heroes. And we, you and I, all of us, we are all heroes here. Maybe not like King Arthur or Robin Hood or Joshua Jericho or Rambo. We are small heroes. Um, that is, after all, what history really is about, the small heroes. The ones who go across the mountains on faith and despite fear. The ones who go into a boat believing that the world is flat. The one who gave their lives in the camps that others might live. And the ones who died in the camps just wanting to live another day. We are all heroes here. That was true back then and it's true now. Um, it will be true tomorrow. That's what life is about. It is a living and continuous process that we're all part of. My book begins with the sentence, I'm tired of remembering. It ends with the words, I remember, I remember. Time travel books can give us all, especially you guys, uh, back our cultural and historic memories by making history an experiential act. Writers and, and storytellers, I believe, are the memory of civilization. Um, those of us alive now really must not forget what happened to that, in that awful time or else we'll be, down, we'll be doomed to repeat it. I researched um, The Devil's Arithmetic for about a year and a half. Um, when I was done, I, would, I swore to myself I would never write another book on the Holocaust because it took such an emotional toll. However, I did. I wrote another novel for um, adults, which now is read by um, upper level high school and college. Um, I loved finishing both books because I felt I had done something important. I hated being in those books as I was writing them. Because you can read a book, maybe even The Devil's Arithmetic, in a day or a week. I was there for a year and a half in that place, in that time. That was one of the most difficult periods of my life. I want to end with two more of my Holocaust poems. And then Greg is going to ask me some questions which are culled from questions that you uh, sent in. And if there's any time left after that, uh, we'll see if we can get some questions from the audience, if, you're, if you're, um, you still have some. The first is a poem that I wrote in college. It's called The Rivers of Babylon in Memoriam. I am told there is grass at Auschwitz and people picnic there again beside the iron maw that swallowed the expended children. Good wine, white from the Rhineland, flows from open necks down laughing mouths and papers litter the ominous mounds, receptacles that cry for truth. If we forget these, will our tongues cleave to dry mouths or hands hang helpless at our sides? Unstrung the hearts of this new exile whisper from the swaying trees, this exile soft, this new God quick to ease our memories. Is it with humanity more fine we choose to hymn the dead alive with laughter than wail the grave and martyred Jews? And the second one, I wrote um, a couple of years ago. Uh, it's called Ich bin Ayud. 
I am a Jew. Uh, and it's a, a true, his, uh, it's based on a true Holocaust anecdote that I found in a book. The rabbi's daughter, savaged by a thousand cuts, a thousand bites from Grazia's dogs, called out for each cut, each bite, that she was a Jew and would not kneel. She died on her knees, but not kneeling. For she stood upright at the throne of God. God, I wish I had such courage to not kneel in the face of outrage, the teeth of tyranny, the knives of the unholy. Instead, I change the channels. I turn the page. I write a small poem to the rabbi's, in the rabbi's daughter's honor. I, who do not even know her name. So thank you very much for listening and for being um, here and learning about justice and witnessing. And now Greg is going to ask those questions. First of all, thank you, Jane Yolen. And what I find, and I just, just for the benefit of everybody who's here, you are at the Robert H. Jackson Center, and one of the co-founders and president. Just to tie all of this in, I think it is important to know that Justice Jackson, who is from here, from here where we are today, went on to become the chief American prosecutor at the Nuremberg trial, and there are pictures around here. And it's at that Nuremberg trial, which was the place where for the very first time, the evidence of the Holocaust was presented and documented. And it's that evidence of that particular time, no matter how difficult it is, and, and, and know how difficult it was for you to research that we were able to have that here. So there's a wonderful tie-in today for the appearance of a Jane Yolen to discuss Devil's Arithmetic and to have it here at the Robert H. Jackson Center where in fact we're here to honor the legacy of the man who was the chief American prosecutor at that Nuremberg trial. So again, I thank one and all for that opportunity. Here are some questions submitted by Shore Road School, Oceanside School, McKenna Elementary School, among others. So let's just dive into this. Is the story based on facts that you learned from people you knew, that you'd actually know? Uh, the only, uh, the only um, facts that I learned from people I knew was the story of the Midden Pile and a couple of uh, questions that I, that I asked in interviews with survivors. It's very hard to ask questions. One of the things I wanted to know was, what color was the ink um, that the tattoos were in, and what did they look like, you know, at, at the time, and what did they look like now? And one woman just simply went like this to me, and I saw her, her, uh, the number tattoo, and then she told me what color it had been when it was put mm -hmm. on, and I said, "Did it hurt?" And she said, "Yes." You know, they didn't numb the skin or anything; they just did it. Uh, and they, everybody was frightened, and they, they had just been torn away from their families. And so, but only those few things. <coughs> the rest of it was research. Was it coincidence that Chaya meant life, or was it your intention? Uh, Greg, I'm going to teach you how to say. Please. Chaya. Chaya. It's back in the throat. Chaya. 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 Okay. Chaya. Good. You got it. You got it? Thank you. <laughs> I make you all honorary Jews. As to the question. Uh, well, repeat the question. I was too busy ca chastising you. Oh, you were. <laughs> chastising you. Yes. Uh, it was a coincidence that Haya meant life, or was it your intention? Um, it was my intention. It was also my daughter's uh, Hebrew name, Haya. Um, her name is Heidi. And she was my firstborn, so Chaya seemed like, you know, a good name. My Hebrew name is Simcha, which means joy. My cousin Joy was born two weeks before I was, so 
they kept the J and called me Jane. Um, but actually, we were both named after my grandfather, whose name was Samson, but his Hebrew name was Simcha. So. Was the flashback all a dream? Ah, uh, how many people who have finished the book think that the flashback is a dream? How many think uh, uh, it was real? How many don't have a clue? <laughs> it's your call. <laughs> I only write this stuff. No, I, I have my own thoughts about it, but I keep them to myself because I think it's more important for the readers to try to figure it out from text. From conception to conclusion, when you finally deliver that final manuscript, uh, how long did it take? Probably almost two years. But then I had to do like four or five major revisions for the editor. And at one point, she said to me, you're not, this is something I don't normally tell anybody, so here's a little. She said to me, um, I have something that I want you to think about because I think you need to do it in the book. I'll send you, I said, what? She said, well, I don't want to tell it to you on the phone. Um, I want you to read it. I said, okay. And she sent it to me. But I was about to go off on a trip for two weeks with my husband to Europe. And so I didn't open the letter. And right before I left, my agent called and she said, what did you think of the letter? Because she got a copy of it. And I said, well, I haven't read it. She said, we well, have to read it. I said, if it's bad, I don't want to be thinking about it the whole time I'm in Europe. I want to have fun. If it's okay, then it doesn't matter, you know? She said, you're impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I came back, I opened the letter, and this is what it said. I'm very uncomfortable with this being a time travel book. Now remember, this began as a time travel book. I talked to her about it as a time travel book. In the contract, it said a time travel book in which a girl goes back in time to the time of the Holocaust. She said, I think that the old grandfather um, should just tell her about his time in the camps. And I went, that's not acceptable. I said, there are, I, I can take the book elsewhere if, if, if you're uncomfortable with it. I understand that. But that's, that's the one non-negotiable part of this book. Um, she said, well, would you, I'll have three other editors read it here. And um, would you come in to New York uh, and, and talk to us about it? And I said, uh, I said uh, let me get back to you on that. And then I sat down and I thought, I live three-hour drive from New York City. To drive down three hours to have people yell at me and then drive back three hours did not sound like a good time to me. <laughs> did it sound like a good time to any of you? No. no. So I said to her, tell you what. I will sit in my house with a cup of tea and a notebook and a good pen, and you and I and your three editors who have read it can have a conference call. She said, I don't know how to do that. I said, find out. <laughs> Otherwise, I will, you know, I, if, if you, you're not satisfied with it, I'm not going to change that. I will change other things, but I will not change that. Uh, I will take the book elsewhere. And I told that to my agent, who has always said to me, I can help you only if you're willing to walk away from a deal. So she said, good. So I get my cup of tea on the appointed day. I'm sitting there with my notebook, with my pen, ready you know, to do battle. Uh, the phone rings, and the three editors, other editors, and my editor are there. And the three editors are gushing about how wonderful the book is. Oh, this is wonderful, and we don't want you to change that. We just want you to sharpen the way she goes back to the past, the way she comes back to the, to the future. Just sharpen that, and then we're happy. And I said to my editor, and you? She said, I'm good. So uh, that's why it's still at Viking. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, actually, you expanded on it tremendously. And, but it's curious, the relationship that a writer has with agent. I mean, there's some players in this game here, editors. I mean, I would think it's often difficult. It's your work product. It's your hard sweat and toil. And yet there's somebody who's reading it for the first time and really telling you what to change. But in fact, 
many of the things over the four revisions that she asked for improved the book. But this one was a step too far. She had never liked fantasy anyway, so she was uncomfortable with the whole idea mm -hmm. all along, but, but had gone with it because she wanted the book. And then, down near the end, she wanted a different book. I'm having that same fight right now with a different editor about a different book um, that I'm writing with my son, Adam, and we are about to tell the editor that we think he's he wants to change the book to give a different character the main role, which we can't do. So you have to be willing to say, even if this book never gets published, I will take it back because I will not destroy the book in order to get it published. You've written, oh, 300, this is your 300th book coming up. No, no, my 300th book came out. Okay, well, like I said, and <laughs> which is a tremendous, tremendous uh, feat. Do you have some stuff that you, in fact, concluded in your mind's eye manuscript that's sitting on a shelf someplace? Oh, yeah. I, I have some that every once in a while I haul them out and I go, mm, yeah, bad idea. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have others that I go, I don't know why this one's never sold, but maybe if I do this, this, and this, it will sell. I have a book coming out any day now called, um, it's the, the Day Tiger Rose Said Goodbye. It's, every author has a dead dog book or a dead cat book in them. And that's my dead cat book. <laughs> um, and I've tried to sell that book for like 20 years. And most people run shrieking, oh my, I can't do this. And I tinkered with it, and I worked on it. And suddenly, I showed it to an editor who had never seen it before. Um, she was younger than I, a lot younger than I am, so evidently she had come up during the time that I was trying to sell it to other people. And she fell in love with the book. She had a really good idea uh, for how to make the ending work better. And the book is coming out with gorgeous pictures by Jim LaMarche. So sometimes a book needs to come out at the right time mm -hmm. with the right editor, and you just keep going. I mean, nobody else ever asked me to write a Holocaust novel, but this one editor. You've had books that you've published almost, well, 50 years. Was there somebody when you first got started, you said, I'd like to emulate that particular writer? Was there a role model? Um, my three role models are um, Isaac Dennison, who was a great fairy tale writer, adult fairy tale writer. She never wrote any children's books. Um, uh, James Thurber. I love his, his writing, both for adults and children. He was a friend of my father's, um, a terrible drunk. And if you're a friend of his, you had to just take him home. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the third one would be Robert Louis Stevenson, who wrote three totally iconic books that's, that really started their own genres. Uh, one is A Child's Garden of Verses, one is Jekyll and Hyde, and one is Treasure yeah. Island. Amazing range, but he's also, also wrote a lot of other books that I love. Um, that, that, and that I reread. Today on a plane back, what will you read? What, what does, will you, I, what, just for casual reading, what does a Jane Yolen pick up? A lot of mysteries, poetry, historical novels, and biography. We'll give sometimes you one fantasy, out. sometimes fantasy. We'll make sure but I don't read fantasy when I'm writing <coughs> fantasy. Because mm -hmm the voice gets in the way of what I'm writing. What were you feeling when you wrote this book? Did you, did you cry when you wrote it? Was there, was there chemistry, emotions? There were moments when I was pretty weepy mm -hmm. writing it. And that scene that I read, that made me cry. But also the ending really made me cry. And when certain people die in the book that you like, I cried then as well. What's new? What's next? I am writing a fantasy novel right now um, that's a redoing of the Sleeping Beauty story. 
uh, from the point of view of the 13th fairy who, you know, was going to have her die by um, pricking her finger on the spindle when she was 16. Only this is the 13th fairy is, um, is a 13-year-old girl, um, a 13-year-old fairy girl. And, um, and it's all a mistake, and the girl is uh, a little accident prone, and um, uh, it's her story. And I like her a lot. And the king and the queen and the princess are disgusting, awful, horrible people. And they all deserve to sleep for 100 years until the world passes them by. <laughs> so that's what I'm working on right now. Boys, girls, teachers, we have been a witness to an individual who Newsweek called the Hans Christian Andersen of America. The New York Times called her the modern equivalent of Aesop, somebody who has blessed us with 300 published books, countless poems and short stories, and we've had the pleasure right here at the Robert Jackson Center to bear witness to one of the real icons in uh, authors and to Jane Yolen, we say many, many thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.